हम भन्थे ती शरण हेर्न सह पञ्च सेलानी या चामी दुटी एम पी हम भन्थे ती शरण हेर्न सह पञ्च सेलानी या चामी तटी एम पी हम भन्थे ती शरण हेर्न सह पञ्च सेलानी या चामी नमो तस भगवतो अर्हतो समुदस 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 गच्छामि गच्छामि ताती ामीरमणिमी सिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसा वादा वेरमणि सिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसा वादा वेरमणि सिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरा मेरया मज्जा पमाटा ना वेरमणि सिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरा मेरया मज्जा पमाटा ना ोगसंपदा Anatta Pindika Vada Sutta, advice to Anatta Pindika. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's park. Now on that occasion, the householder Anatta Pindika was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. Then he addressed a certain man thus: Come, good man, go to the Blessed One. Pay homage in my name with your head at his feet and say, "Venerable sir, the householder Anatta Pindika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Blessed One's feet. Then go to the venerable Sariputta, pay homage in my name with your head at his feet and say, 'Venerable sir, the householder Anatta Pindika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the venerable Sariputta's feet.'" Then say, it would be good, venerable sir, if the venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder Anatta Pindika 
out of compassion. Yes, sir, the man replied. He went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, he sat down on one side and delivered his message. And he went to the Venerable Sariputta, and after paying homage to the Venerable Sariputta, he delivered his message, saying, It would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder, Anadapindika, out of compassion. The Venerable Sariputta consented in silence. Then the Venerable Sariputta dressed, and taking his bowl and a robe, went to the residence of the householder, Anadapindika, with the Venerable Ananda as his attendant. Having gone there, he sat down on a seat made ready and said to the householder and Akapindika, I hope you are getting well, householder. I hope you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that their subsiding, not their increase, is apparent. Venerable Sariputta, I'm not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing not subsiding. Their increase and their not subsiding is apparent, just as if a strong man was splitting my head open with a sharp sword, so too violent winds cut through my head. I am not getting well, just as if strong just as if a strong man were tightening a tough feather strap around my head as a headband, so too there are violent pains in my head. I am not getting well. Just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so too Violent winds are carving up my belly. I am not getting well. Just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals, so too there is a violent burning in my body. I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and their not subsiding is apparent. Then, householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the eye, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. Note 1305. M.A. says that clinging to the eye takes place by way of desire and lust. Consciousness is dependent on the eye by way of craving and views. However, since Anatta Pidika was already a stream enterer, dependence for him would have involved only craving, views having been eradicated by the path of stream entry. Thus, you should train. You should train thus. I will not cling to the ear. I will not cling to the nose. I will not cling to the tongue, I will not cling to the body, I will not cling to the mind, and my consciousness will not depend on the mind. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to forms, I will not cling to sounds, I will not cling to odors, I will not cling to flavors, I will not cling to tangibles, I will not cling to mind objects, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind objects, thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to eye consciousness, I will not cling to ear consciousness, I will not cling to nose consciousness, I will not cling to tongue consciousness, I will not cling to body consciousness, I will not cling to mind consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind consciousness, thus you should train. So, Bhante, this is, this is the basically the instructions from the buddha right so i mean to me it's like very confusing how do you practice this i will not cling to forms i will not cling to eye consciousness etc like um do you just say it to yourself or i mean this has to be like a wisdom right the seeing as this yes it means training to be mindful. The, the, I mean, the point he's making is the, the ability to tell between right and wrong um, uh, approach. There's Ayoni, what we call Ayoni Somanasikara and Yoni Somanasikara. And a big part of mindfulness is the ability to notice when you are clinging. I mean, it's just, just a formal way of telling him that. The only reason why you're suffering is because of these things, because of attachment. If you're attaching, it's attaching to one of these many things. Another important reason for teaching all of these different parts is to enumerate them 
because these are the things that you cling to. We think that we cling to people or places or things, but the reality behind it is just the senses and so on, the elements. And when you see that, then you realize there's, or you, it's clear that there's nothing to be clung to because, of course, these things are not something that have any reason to cling to. It's only when we extrapolate on them that we cling to them. Yeah, so the reason I'm not asking this is uh, because I feel like many people misunderstand that they should tell themselves this, these types of notes in their head, like, oh, I, I should not cling to this or I should not keep cling to that. Or Telling doesn't make it so, that's the problem. Exactly. Yeah, Vairabhasaraputta is not uh, teaching a meditation technique. He's saying what one should uh, not do. So uh, Anatha Pindika is already a Sotapana, so he, he would know what he means by how would uh -huh. not cling to them. So he would know First, what it means. Like, I think the key word is he's saying you should train thus. He's not saying you should not cling to the eye. He's saying uh, should not, you should train thus. Yeah, I... Yeah. You should train thus. I don't think it uh, implies that you should uh, repeat the words. I mean, you should train in a way that results in this. Yeah, I didn't mean repeat the words. I mean, like, uh, you should train to not cling, uh, whatever that is. These uh, passages is not um, related to right. So, for instance, if you know that um, you eating only for the um, purpose of training in mindfulness uh, and then you want to eat something outside of your meal, you intentionally know that this is not right because it's a wrong view. So it's not related to these passages to have a, a right view first. Right view is to see the the see clearly the experience, well, to see the four noble truths. But basically, that means to see the things clearly. Anatta Pindika already had what you might call right view. Uh, he was just refining it as a sikha, as a sotapanna. This was much more about, I think, about uh, the causes of his suffering. That he wasn't suffering because of the experiences, he was suffering because of the craving, the attachment. Another thing is when, when uh, just hearing the Dhamma, that would already be in different ways familiar, but here he's hearing it in a new way. He'd never heard this exact teaching before. Um, he never heard such a deep teaching, in fact. He had always been given much more uh, sort of basic teachings. Uh, it, it is that it, it, even though it may be familiar to him, it, it, uh, it's a good thing to hear when he passes away because it uh, keeps his mind, it reminds him of things that are important when he's passing away. It's not just the lesson, it's the hearing of the Dhamma that's, that's valuable. I was just wondering that he is already a sort of panna here, uh, so like his experience would be like much much deeper than uh, even like hearing something. But, like he would know this uh, experience should be like you know. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, it's not even it's not so much that he's being taught something new, though he kind of apparently is. It's also that uh, it's just valuable to hear these things. Just listening to this. Imagine if, if you are being mindful, right? You're here sitting here being mindful and then you hear these things. That's going to help you catch. You'll catch when your mind is attached. And you go, oh, yes. I'm not following this instruction right. because I'm clinging to things. Yes. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to eye contact. I will not cling to ear contact. I will not cling to nose contact. I will not cling to tongue contact. I will not cling to body contact. I will not cling to mind contact. 
and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind contact. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to feeling born of eye contact. I will not cling to feeling born of ear contact. I will not cling to feeling born of nose contact. I will not cling to feeling born of tongue contact. I will not cling to feeling born of body contact. I will not cling to feeling born of mind contact. And my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of mind contact. Thus you should train. 10. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the earth element. I will not cling to the water element. I will not cling to the fire element. I will not cling to the air element. I will not cling to the space element. I will not cling to the consciousness element. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the consciousness element. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to material form. I will not cling to feeling. I will not cling to perception. I will not cling to formations. I will not cling to consciousness. And my consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the base of infinite space. I will not cling to the base of infinite consciousness. I will not cling to the base of nothingness. I will not cling to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Thus, you should pray. May I ask, uh, Bhante, what is um, my consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness? Well, he's going through the it's part of the senses, right, or part of the part of the aggregates. Aggregates, but also it says the same thing when uh, going through, the, um, I guess, the body parts, like the earth element, fire, water, space. Well, it's the same as with anything else. I mean, oh yeah. Something like, there's nothing special about consciousness. You can become, you can cling to consciousness. I guess what, what I mean, what I don't know, consciousness, um, it's not dependent on consciousness. Well, dependency is like you depend on it to be a certain way. Or you depend mm. on it to be there. Without it, you're not, you're not at peace. Without it, you're disturbed. Oh. Yeah, or the if if when someone is uh, co cognizing, then they are bothered by that, right? They're dependent on it, if dependent on it being mm -hmm. there or being a certain way or not being a certain way. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So uh, here it's from the, the Satipatthana Sutta, where the Buddha says, "Anisito Javiharati," one dwells independent. And that's the word that's being used here. The Buddha says, uh, nisito or vinyana nisito, dependent on. It's a very important uh, part of the teaching to be independent. So that you don't yeah. depend on anything. Yeah, but these, these are just English words to me, right? So it's, it's not that easy to understand what uh, it's meant. Well, dependent means you depend. If you depend on a person, for example, like old uh, old people will depend on their children to care for them, and they'll suffer if they if their children neglect them. Hmm. Uh, a drug addict is dependent on their drugs. They depend upon them. Means they 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 rely on them. They need them to be happy. They suffer without them. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to this world, and my consciousness will not be dependent on this world. I will not cling to the world behind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the world behind. Thus, you should train. 14. 
Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to what is seen, hear, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, thought after, and examined by the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on that. Thus, you should train. When this was said, the householder An Anathapindika wept and shed tears. Then the venerable Ananda asked him, Are you foundering, householder? Are you sinking? I am not foundering, vener venerable But although I have long waited upon the teacher and bhikkhus to worthy of esteem, never before have I heard such a talk on the Dhamma. Such talk on the Dhamma, householder, is not given to lay people clothed in white. Such talk on the Dhamma is given to those who have gone forth. Note 1306 This statement does not imply that there is any inherent exclusiveness or arbitrary discrimination in the Buddha's way of presenting his teaching. But as those who remain in lay life must look after their families, possessions and occupation, such talk leading to complete detachment would not have been appropriate for them. Well then, Venerable Sariputta, let such talk on Dhamma be given to lay people clothed in white. There are clansmen with little dust in their eyes, who are w wasting away through not hearing such talk on the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. Then, after giving the householder Anantapindika this advice, the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Ananda rose from their seats and departed. Soon after they had left, the householder Anantapindika died and reappeared in the Tusita heaven. Then when the night was well advanced, Anantapindika, now a young god of beautiful appearance, went to the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of Jeta's grove. After paying homage to the Blessed One, he stood at one side and addressed the Blessed One in stanzas. Oh, blessed is this Jeta's grove, dwelt in by the sage, sagely Sangha, wherein res resides the King of Dhamma, the fount of all my happiness. By action, knowledge and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these are mortal, mortals purified, not by lineage of wealth. Therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it. Sariputta has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways. Any bhikkhu who has gone beyond at the best can only equal him. That is what the young god Anatta Pindika said, and the teacher proved. Then the young god Anatta Pindika, thinking, the teacher has approved of me paid homage to the Blessed One, and keeping him on his right, he vanished at once. When the night had ended, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, last night, when the night was well advanced, there came to me a certain young god of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of Jetta's grove. After paying homage to me, he stood at one side and addressed me in stanzas thus, O oh, Blessed One, is this Jetta's Grove? At best can only equal him. That is what the young God said. Then the young God thinking, the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to me, and keeping me on his right, he vanished at once. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Surely, Venerable Sir, that young God must have been Anatha Pindika, for the householder Anatha Pindika had perfect confidence in the Venerable Sariputta. Good God, Ananda, as far as the reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. Then God was Anatha Pindika, no one else. 
that is what the blessed one said the venerable ananda was satisfied and delighted in the blessed one's words do god interact with him not not very often but there are there are different types of devas some are apparently hanging around on earth in trees or in the sky will they be, i mean it seems that anath pandika passed away and appeared as a young god already capable of talking and all of that is there no babies and growth time and all of that no they're called opapadika they have a deva is opapadika rises is born fully formed in instantaneous birth right yeah in deva realm yes the the, the yeah, worm born is yeah, only an animal same. and human realm only right the ghosts as well interesting thank you yeah actually many beings appear spontaneously like even hell beings appear spontaneously ghosts brahmas arupa beings they thought one day said and ghosts also appear through womb womb yes. birth it's rare but uh, ghosts ghosts uh, mostly appear uh, spontaneously as well it's rare but womb birth is possible there as well uh right as in the hell they they are all instantaneous right they are not womb born right um i heard a monk say once that um when there's ghosts that appear that there's usually a reason behind it they don't just appear for nothing and that they would like us to transfer merits or something along those lines is this true or do we just treat it as seeing seeing in our practice Well, you can send as with all beings when beings approach you you can remember to have a sense of friendliness towards them wishing them well the thing about yes, those yeah. is they're they're in they're they're in a suffering state so you have compassion for them wishing them to be free from suffering it's a good uh, good response is the story about uh, the voices heard by king kosada heard voices of course i think then uh, his advices uh, uh, i tried to put it so there was a i mean in the very last moment that anatta pindika when he said that Oh, I, I never heard such a teaching and um, they say I I I don't know who is uh, answering is it Saiputta who says that uh, we don't teach this to house householders I think so So is this the turning point where they uh where they allowed um to such talk or such teaching to be given to lay people as well in white result mm-hmm. because to me it seems that i kept like um many monks wouldn't teach um lay people deeper deeper teaching them dana and sila this reminds me more of the tibetan buddhism where there's the true tradition because i don't feel like it's in theravada buddhism i mean at least we have the texts for everyone available but i'm guessing in in um 
in the old times, the texts weren't available to anyone. Only for yeah, there were no texts. Yeah. Well, it's hard to understand these sorts of teachings when you're surrounded by worldly conceptual things. Kind of talk that you would save for someone who was engaged in intensive uh, pursuit of enlightenment and Buddhist teaching. So we see this sort of talk in context of the meditation center, meditation course. Uh, just in the last paragraph, uh, when my Rabbanana says, uh, when we said that the young God must have been another Pindika, then the Buddha says, uh, good, good, Dhananda, as far as reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. Which means the Buddha is saying that you have that through reason you have come to that conclusion, not by direct knowledge. But it is correct. I mean, <clears throat> what uh, Bante was just saying that uh, I I was thinking the same thing. Like this uh, will, if you are not practicing intensively, like you are already, I don't know, maybe days into or months into intensive practice, then you can understand these parts, um, feeling born of eye contact and things like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a sense that if you haven't left the home life, you're still distracted by many things. And so they wouldn't teach it to people when they went to their homes, they would teach much more basic things. King Suddhodana requested the Buddha to ordain children without the permission of parents. He was also clinging to the children, even though he was a Sotapanna. So, still they have uh, attachment. Maybe not ready for deeper Dhamma. Well, unless, of course, one is uh, close to death. When one is close to death, uh, one's mind becomes much more sharper. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the beginning, I wasn't <clears throat> sure if this Anatta Pindika was the same Anatta Pindika who uh, gave, gave the Chetas Grove to, or Chetavana Monastery uh, to the Buddha. But then yep, I... Um, it's the same. What did did he have family, Bante? He did have daughters and sons. I think his daughter, one of his daughters, became a Sakadagami. His son became an Anagami. Yeah, sorry, uh, became a Sotapanna after convincing oh. to. Uh, I mean, he didn't want to listen to the Dhamma uh, or go to the go listen to sermons. So uh, another Pindika bribed him to go listen and learn one Dhamma teaching and then you'll get a hundred thousand gold coins or something like that. No, for us, I think I think the first day uh, the bribe was if you just spend the night at Jetavana or spend one day I will give you this much money. So he went and spent one day and then second day he said uh, if you learn one Dhamma teaching this much money. Then he tried to learn one Dhamma teaching and then he became Sotapanna after that. So is it more likely for one to be uh, more capable of deeper teachings when uh, under such such extreme conditions because you would think you're distracted by a lot of pain and I, I wouldn't think you have a very clear mind when you have these these sicknesses which Anathapindika described. The point is you're not distracted by you're not so distracted by worldly things when you're sick. You're not trying to you're not able to find relief in in the world. So you're receptive to something a little more 
a little deeper. The commentary says, because of uh, fierce attachments, fierce dependency or, or clinging to, that's, what did it say, to uh, land and belongings and silver and gold and servants and sons and daughters and wives and husbands. Because of that, you do not delight in the teaching. It does not resonate with you. You do not delight in it. What I'm what I'm thinking when you have like such a broken body, you know, it's more likely that you don't want to keep it or you don't want to do anything with it actually, and uh, so much easier. Not not the clinging is not there. I think. Vante <clears throat> Nita asks in the chat with the way. When Narabha Sariputta starts by describing coarse perception, then goes on to describing finer perceptions, is this supposed to show how progression in vipassana practice works? No, this is just categorizing things. It's not really that much of a progression here. There is some, you do start out with some simpler, simpler ideas and the more advanced ones are say the the say the Arupa jhanas, but that's not really significant. There's no progression in that regard. I mean, it's not like you go from one set of these things to another set of these things. This is just typical of it's more like looking at looking at a gem from different sides, looking at different facets of the same gem. That you look at the teaching from different facets, from, from different sides, can help to look at it in different ways. I mean, I think even just understanding one thing uh, thoroughly would get you enlightened. These are just various ways, right? Well, like for example, some people are there. There's this teaching on how some people are more attached to the mind. And some people are more attached to the body and some people are attached to both. And so there's different sets that are more focused on the mind, like the, uh, the, the five aggregates is four, four of them are mental and one of them is physical. Created on the body, so teaching the, the faculties because that's mostly physical. It's talking about the senses, uh, uh, the, the the eye and forms. Those are both physical. And then I think the datus is, is half and half. So focusing on them is, oh no, the, sorry, the datus is uh, is more mental, more physical. And the indriyas mm -hmm. is, 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 is balanced, almost balanced. Because the indriyas is just the, just the, no, not the indriyas. Anyway, there's different lists that are more mental and more physical. Thank you. From from the recent discussion, whatever you suggested, Bhante, it seems that the time of birth when there is, uh, the, sorry, the time of death mm -hmm. when there is clearly a lot of pain and no clinging is probably a very key time and the right teaching given by the right person at that time would probably help every lot of people in order to achieve more than otherwise what they could have. Is that the right understanding? Yeah, the fact that he's surprised reminds us of how different the teaching is and how more how deep, yeah. more receptive they are to deep teachings at the moment of death or when one is sick. How important it is when you're sick, how important the Dhamma becomes. Were, were there any uh, indication that he progressed on the um, 
path. Like uh, he was already a stream enter when uh, he was listening to this teaching. So did he become a um, once returner, Sakadagami? I think there is some idea that he isn't going to come back to be born as a human again. So I don't know what that means. But he's probably still in heaven. To Sita, yes. Only like a few days have passed since the day he died. According to how time works in To Sita. What, what are the two days? Few days have passed. Like uh, in Tusita Heaven, I think it's uh, four hundred. Uh, okay. This uh, probably happened like two thousand five hundred years. It's like uh, yeah, if you do the math, six seven days. And another reason, I think Mante also mentioned this earlier to. Uh, Teacher, give a Dhamma teaching to a person who's dying or somebody who's even somebody who is suffering from a sickness. And the mind is uh, contemplating on the Dhamma or uh, focusing on the Dhamma, the physical sickness is also subsiding. Even the Buddha himself used the uh, Bojanga uh, Parita to subside. Uh, Physical ailment or sickness. There are other examples of arahants using. It seems to me like it, it's so different the conversation uh, with the arahant than his conversation with Ananda. So to me, it, it feels like Sariputta has no, like, he's not pitying him or. <laughs> Or anything like it, he's like all moved by the situation. I just uh, admire that. The another reason to give uh, a salmon, tamma salmon to a person who is about to die is because, uh, let's say, it's an, an ordinary person, not a uh, sotapanna. Uh, so his uh, next birth uh, will be determined by whatever karma that comes forward. So if he hears some uh, the dharma and then he's uh, uh, he becomes uh, satisfied with it, then that could become an asana karma, a near death karma, which could give his next birth. Uh, Bante, what happens when it seems like during that time I'm not conscious of the mind getting carried away, but the memory remains and breathing pattern is also very different. Well, practically speaking, you should just note as you experience it, as you remember it, as you recall it. And they're technical. If you want to learn about how the mind works, you can study the Abhidhamma, but practically it's not that useful. It, the most useful is just to be aware of as you experience it. I mean, asking what happens is not all that valuable. Just try, I mean, you try to be a little bit sharper, train yourself, and eventually you'll see you start to, you, you're, you're more aware less carried away. Actually, this kind of helps me recall one of the answer Bhante had given to somebody who asked about rebirth. You know, Bhante had mentioned and from one's own direct experience, there is never death because you're constantly experiencing one to the other only from the external point of view that there is death. Yeah. I just happened to recall well, that. Death death is every moment. We actually die every moment. It's not that there's no death. That would be that would be some sort of permanence. It's that uh, I mean I I think I think you you're remembering correctly and I did say something like that, I'm sure. 
and it's just the death of a person the death of a being isn't real there's no being death the what we are dies every moment it doesn't last from one moment to the next it's a clear way of uh, uh changing a conceptual conversation into a conversation about uh, ultimate reality um bante when when the world is scary the way i mean you still have a uh, could have a control over over that if the tranquility is so strong from from what don has asked me it no, appears no, that there is no control yeah yeah but that's it's a sign of of if you're not mindful during that time it's a sign of usually uh distraction and generally unwholesomeness and lack of mindfulness and the desire attachment interest in it you know not be very sharp so you're not you're not aware of it until later well that's one uh, one side of caring uh carried away right but there is like also like the just the tranquility is so it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then it's just you realize oh time's gone yeah i mean either way it doesn't matter the the, the point is there's no need to understand what happened there yeah it's past sure. you, you you're, you're practically shouldn't be too what what that was that's a common question what was that <laughs> that thing that just happened what was the most important quality of it is it was strange and being thrown off guard by things that make you ask what they were being disconcerted by something that you didn't expect or that you couldn't control and that's an, that's the important thing to to see because it helps you become less attached expectant uh, less trying to control when you when you just suddenly realize i was totally out of control i had no control there yeah. it can be kind of scary but that's important it it helps you let go stop trying to control you and you realize so yeah that's just not going to work and is it then beneficial to uh, recognize like signs when let's say um nodding off like being very sleepy and like almost dozing off when this happens for me it was like there there were signs when i started to um have conversations or whatever but being very in, immersed in them but noticing oh this happens again so now i have to be more careful like um, like pushing a little bit harder is is it a good thing or should should you not work in that way no well, it's that's just stress or greed or guilt or it can be many different things shouldn't the buddha gave a simile of a person treading water and a person racing uh, ahead and you shouldn't do either when you're when you're stuck in the middle of the ocean you have to pace yourself you can't push you should never be pushing or or tire yourself out but you also just can't sit still to have tread water stay still it could call it could also also be the uh, hindrance with that catedness uh, so that something you should not as well i guess yeah there, but there are states near the end of the course where the mind is going out where it feels like there's a it's almost cessation it's because the mind is kind of lo loosening its grasp on samsara on on experiences so there are moments of feeling like you weren't sure where you went there's different just different kinds of experience yeah that's also very uncontrollable and But the most common is one that you can recognize as a cause is caused by distraction is caused by 
Mas Mas Sangka Sen Dachal Actually, I was going to say Tina Minta more. Uh-huh. Uh, can be caused by distraction, can be caused by attachments. There can be physical components as well. You eat a lot. Or if you've been working very hard during the day. So can one um, lead to the other, like uh, distraction lead to uh, drowsiness? Because that was that seemed like it was the case for me. Thinking a lot, then being not being mindful, and then just um, yeah, being very tired. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they're related. How do you know the air element before it arises? Sensations can also arise in the belly. Do you know those sensations, such as tension, as worry, or as tension, or feeling? No, you don't know them as tension because it's perceptive of you to ask, but yes, that's important is to realize that they are not the actual anxiety. Otherwise, um, it can exacerbate the problem as you feel like you're so anxious so i'm so anxious but you're actually not mostly anxiety most of it is just physical the anxiety is quite fleeting but it keeps jabbing you the anxiety jabs you and then you you suffer from it with all the physical consequences and then it hits you again and it keeps prodding you but if you can distinguish then you don't get upset about the physical you say oh this isn't anxiety butterflies in my stomach this is i'm not anxious this is just Physical, even when your heart is beating very fast, that's not anxiety. That's just physical. It's very helpful for people who suffer from anxiety to be able to remind themselves that I'm not anxious. And then to notice when they are anxious that it's just those moments. And they, they catch them and that, that accuracy is very valuable. And they it, it loses its power that this overwhelming feeling of oh i'm so anxious but you're not really you're just physically affected by anxiety that's just physical there's nothing special or fearsome or dangerous about it scary about it just experiences there, there is also like usually like dislike for for those uh, physical uh, f- well, for someone who's anxious, it usually makes them more anxious. They get because anxious they don't because like of the physical. That, right? yeah. okay. Well, it doesn't have to be. I mean, yeah, the fear can be involved, which is which is anger based. But for people who have panic attacks, it doesn't have to be a. There's usually fear, I suppose, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be more and more anxious. Um, but there is possible for me who never had a panic attack or uh, not really anxious person or something to understand this uh, from how people describe it? No, it's still just experiences. There's nothing extraordinary about it. Just take it as they describe it. I mean, help them to understand Uh what is physical and what is mental. Yeah. It's a valuable lesson that that a lot of what we think is mental is not like anger is the same. Most of what we call anger is just physical. The anger itself is is just the kernel. It's just moments. Panic is actually the physical becomes so overwhelming because you get into this oh. feedback loop of triggering it and triggering it and. You, and, and the physical? physical triggers more anxiety. Yeah, the, you actually physically become paralyze and curl up into a ball can't breathe some people pass out because they can't breathe it's not actually a panic attack per se it's just the physical reactions to panic to fear right anxiety worry often yeah. fear so, yeah. how do you know the air element well, i think they were talking about the but physical, the first, yes. yeah. Oh. In in the stomach, you'll feel tension. That's the air element. 
but yeah, just as they said, you note it as you feel it. So it's also depend on the person, how they are percepting. Depends on the experience. And you did mention that study Adhamma to understand how mind works. Is there a particular chapter or uh, I just have to start writing from the beginning. No, there's a book. There's a book on, on a book called the uh, Abhidhamata Sangha. You can read by Bhikkhu Bodhi. He made a translation of it and explanation of it. It's the comp uh, comprehensive manual of Abhidhamma. So we have a study Amidama group, actually. Amidama study group here, and with most yeah, of the students. I was going to say Amidama actually starts with uh, explaining the mind, how the mind, uh, mind states, and so if you start studying Abhidhamma, you will start with the mind. The study groups are also recorded and on. YouTube, if uh, you're interested in seeing them. Just wanted to clarify, uh, I heard that conversation about the elements and being exclusive and not exclusive. Um, the, so the elements are exclusive, right, or not? Elements always arise uh, uh, like a, the minimum number of elements is called the uh, pure octet or shuddhastaka, uh, which contains uh, the four primary elements. So it cannot be uh, there's uh, uh, earth element, fire element, water element. Count arises with others as well. It should be a minimum of eight. Yeah. And at birth, uh, there's more. Practically speaking, when you feel hot, hot you're not hot. If you feel cold, you're not cold. If you feel tension in the stomach, you're not tense. Yeah, I think the Abhidhamma is more trying to describe what the physical realm actually is, and it's not quite how it's experienced. Yeah, even, even, even the elements uh, arise uh, like minimum eight together. The mind at a time, I guess, like the hardness of uh, water element or fire element. Can't focus yeah. more than one. That's time. why I got confused. Or, or the visible aspect of the matter or the taste element of the matter, things like that. That's still part of the kalapa, but uh, you can only, experientially, you can only take one, one side, um, one aspect of it. Yeah, that's what uh, I thought that they are exclusive, at least uh, uh, how they seem to be. Hmm. Yeah. Is there still a mentor program running? Well, we haven't had any meetings. I um, don't know if anyone is interested in leading the meetings. There hasn't been all that much uh, movement or interest. I have a silly question to ask. Um, is it how old Anatha Indika was when he died? I might say somewhere, I don't know though. So it's obvious that he was dying when Venable Sabutta came and Anatha Indika was dying. Was it showing in his face that he was in pain? 
Twenty. I wasn't there actually. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just being vulnerable. Sorry, I was saying I hope you were getting well. So I was thinking that uh, it is it's just courtesy that saying that while on the other side, not being done. So we don't say someone it that is, is done. It is just courtesy it's it's not that meaningful what he says um it's it, it's it's included most likely or it's it's important it's it's important to sh to remind ourselves remind us that we have to be courteous and thoughtful and it's to it's sorry Buddha is expressing his thoughtfulness and his compassion yeah. Another yeah. thing, yeah, I should. I meant. I meant to. Meant to. I meant to comment on this. Is he doesn't actually say. I hope. Let's see. Let's try and translate. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. it's it's misleading to say I hope because that's not what it says at all. It's actually a little more brutal in some senses. He's just saying. He's, he's basically saying what, what Anatta Pindika answers. Anatta Pindika says, I'm not bearing, I'm not, I'm not holding up, I'm not bearing with it, I'm not, I'm not able to, I'm not able to uh, support this. No, I'm not, I'm not able to withstand it. So, the, so all Stary Buddha does is asks for the Are you able to bear with this? Are you able to support this or withstand it? He asks, what, and he asks whether the dukkha, the suffering, is uh, getting better, is is reduced, receding, or and and not getting better. Now, he doesn't say I hope at all. That would be dangerous because, of course, hope is 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 un unwholesome. So it would be kind of. Uh, figure of speech that you'd have to explain, but he doesn't even go that far. He just asks, and that's the polite thing to do is to ask. So I would that's what I wouldn't read too much into. Like it's not all that important for the teaching about it. It's just a polite thing to do is to ask whether they're bearing up. It's a, it's actually a stock phrase that you see whenever this happens, the Buddha would ask the same thing. Thank you, Bhante. Also getting well could also uh... Uh, of the pain subsiding, or whatever, he was not able to bear. It doesn't mean uh, like becoming immortal. But he doesn't say that either, right? Like, uh, are you getting well, right? It's is it there? He asks whether the pain is is coming to an end, is getting better, or does uh -huh. it appear to be ending, and getting worse? It's the stock way of asking uh, what their condition is, asking about their physical condition, I mean, or I the mental be, condition. I would be so happy if someone just asked me, like, uh, are you able to carry the sickness instead of what happened to you <laughs> or something? So much better. How are you coping? Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely... Asking about his mental state here, and it would be weird if he if he would just start with the teaching that that wouldn't make a lot of sense if he did, if he didn't start like first asking asking him about the condition and then start the teaching. If he would start, yeah, I mean it's valuable because Anatta Pindika is a, is able to see that Anatta Pindika is still has clinging, still has reactions to this to the suffering and he's not able to cope mm. very well i mean that's what's important you're sick how are you dealing with it you're dying how are you dealing with it how's your mental is it is it reasonable to think that uh sakadagami for example deals better uh, with pain and sickness and death and everything uh than uh sotapanna can. Well, you think they deal with most things better, yeah? Oh, okay. 
Sakatagami is generally more better at dealing with everything than a Sotapanna for sure. Yeah, I I was uh, initially a little bit confused about the Sotapanas because Visaka was a Sotapanna and she had like, I don't know, many, many tens of children. And then many of the Sotapanas didn't practice and I was just very confused about this. I mean, they just Sakai Ditti. It's what they have eliminated Sakai Ditti and Sila Pata Paramasa and Vichikicha. So uh, they still have uh, Kamarag. They just don't have views. So Vichikicha Ditti. And uh, one of the Padanas is Kamupadana. Kamupadana causes want to do so many things running after sensual pleasures so i know uh, i think so the first person who anata pindika asked to come was the blessed one so i'm just i don't i can't find if he, the blessed was there or not or it was it just um sariputta and anata no, he just he just wanted to let the blessed one know that he was dying. That's all. Oh, he didn't call for him then. Okay. No. Is it possible that a sotapanna um, can sometimes act in unskillful ways, out of habit, um, because of causes and conditions, and recognize it after, knowing that they know better, but because they were unmindful, they can still make unwholesome choices. Yeah, Sotapanna still has bad habits. So can have greed and anger. They can still have even greed and restlessness, worry. Can we say that the Sotapanna is close to a uh, Kutu Jana, uh, who keeps the eight, uh, five precepts instead of an Arahant, because they have, uh, I think, uh, destroyed uh, three feathers, and there's still seven to go. Like, there's still a huge uh, way to go. No, I or think it, it would be the opposite. I mean, this is all just how you say it, but it would generally be a, 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 a very close are closer to an arahant than to a putujana? Uh, because the Buddha himself gave a simile, like uh, he once took uh, some soil to his hand, or oh, oh, he was referring to the soil trapped uh, in his fingertips uh, and comparing it to uh, earth. A Sotapan has uh, extinguished that much of suffering compared to a uh, ordinary being and the suffering he has to extinguish is uh, only the amount of soil in the fingertips so there's no comparison between uh i mean that's like Bhante said so the one is much much close to uh, becoming an arahant than uh ordinary uh becoming a sotapan in fact they are just every lay person also to be a stream and there are which is to be a sotapanna it's like the goal of the life arahant itself may not necessarily be that necessary but avoiding the dukkha and then trying to be a stream and terror, at least to get the first stage of sotapanna is the most important thing I'm at. at least my understanding of some of the teachings was that but as for how it's uh, how it appears to others and even to oneself, it, it won't appear that much different as a sotapanna because all of your habits are still, all of your ordinary habits are still in place. All of, many of your bad, most of your bad habits are still in place. So the way it appears can be very similar, and I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, and I was it just rapidly thinking changes. That... Once, once one becomes a sotapanna, it rapidly changes, but 
in the beginning, it can still feel like you're still making all the same mistakes. But the difference is you're seeing them so much more clearly and you have a whole different perspective. So they do rapidly change. And for Sotapanna, their life does tend to change quite quickly. I mean, well, it depends on their situation, but quite common for great changes to come in their life as a result. I mean, what I understand from Julie's question is that um, sometimes even that you know the correct way to act or react to, to certain things, your habits and conditions, uh, conditionings will still take over sometimes. Right. Yeah, like like uh, if uh, uh, like a uh, uh, normal uh, daughter of uh, I, uh, who has been uh, uh, cultured properly since childhood wouldn't uh, go against parents uh, and. Uh, uh, elope with a stranger just by just after seeing one time, but a sota upon the wood. So <laughs> there's a irony. Yeah, the, the most the most salient quality of a sotapanna is, as Julie mentions, knowing the difference, knowing clearly knowing that something is wrong. Not to say that they'll do as much wrong, they'll, they'll do far less, but um, the, the big difference is their clarity of knowing when they do something wrong, knowing unwholesome mind states for what they are. Also, they don't break the five precepts, uh, so that is huge compared to ordinary early. So let's suppose a Sotapanna inadvertently, I mean, hypothetically, makes a mistake. Uh, maybe a, it's something that you're not supposed to do. He knows that after that. So how does he come out of that? Well, you don't come out of it. You, you, you work on it. It's already passed. Well, Sotapanna doesn't do things that... Uh, result in hell births or so even even if there's a uh, unwholesome uh, moments arising from time to time their attainment trumps uh, everything the attainment of sotapan is called the garuka cup mm. which is the first thing that comes when giving you an expert but you still ha have to uh, face the consequences uh, consequences I think uh, it's called Prabhupada Vipaka after you are born whatever the karma you have done in the past can uh, give results one thing I have a question about the seven more lives uh, thing because I read somewhere that I don't know what exactly they wrote but that it's not exactly seven lives but something like within those one life there are mo multiple existences in one plane for example and you live through that and then you like this is not considered one life where you die as a human for example then reborn as a human and these are two but that's still you know, one cycle i don't think that's correct there may be something about uh, the Anagami realm. If Sotapanna is reborn in the Sudavasa, they might still go through all five of those. That wouldn't count as related to the seven. Yeah, the Anagami realm, Sudavasa, they keep uh, going higher and higher. I, I heard that too, once you are born there. Yeah, I don't think you count those as individuals. In the seven, I think the seven it refers to everything up until the Anagami. That's my guess. Thank you. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you for coming.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.